there is one downside to working in edit mode, and that's that it's inherently destructive, which means that it's hard or sometimes downright impossible to change actions done too far in the past. I'm sure we can all relate to that on some level, but when it comes to modeling in Blender, we want to keep things as non-destructive as possible. Here's what I mean. If I go into edit mode for my cube here, and let's just say I add a bevel, like we've done in previous lessons, with control B, moving my mouse, scrolling up on my mouse wheel, and then left click to confirm. That works great, but what happens if I want to change the shape of this mesh? Well, if I want to make this a little bit longer, I can't simply just scale this out because that gets stretched, but maybe I could move it outwards. So then I could go to X-ray view, select just one side, grab this along the X-axis and move it that way. And that was all right, but what if I wanted to make a more complex edit? Let's say that I wanted to make an extrusion right here in the front. Well, I could add a couple edge loops, hit enter to confirm, but then how exactly am I going to do that? I suppose I could go to face select mode and select all of these faces, and then hit E and Y to extrude along the Y axis. But of course, that's not going to round off this corner. It won't match the bevel. But even if that is what I want, it would be incredibly challenging to change the cut count of this bevel or its width. Of course, right now I can just hit Control Z and undo all of that and go back to where I started and just do it again. But if you've been working on a project for days, then that's just not an option. The alternative is to apply that action as a modifier instead. So I'll go to Object Mode here, go to the Modifiers tab, which is the blue wrench in the Properties Editor, and then I'll go up to Add Modifier. We happen to have a modifier specifically for beveling, so let's use that as an example. I'll go down to the Generate section and choose Bevel, which is the second one in the list. Now we've added a modifier to our modifiers list, and we can change any of the settings here. We can change the width amount, the number of segments, and all of the controls that we had in edit mode, plus even a few more. The difference here is that if I now hit tab to go into edit mode, you'll see the original shape of my cube as a wireframe around the final result of the object. If I were to make a similar edit as before, like hitting S and then X and scaling this along the X axis, then I don't have to worry about stretching at all, and then I can add those loop cuts just fine, control R, scroll up and then hit enter. And then I can take this front face, hit E to extrude and pull that outwards. The benefit of working this way is that the geometry in edit mode is kept incredibly simple. And I only need to select a few edges or a few faces to make bigger changes. Anytime I want to adjust this modifier, then I can just do that in the modifier stack. If I don't want to be looking at the final result of the modifier and I just want to see what my normal mesh looks like in edit mode, then I can just turn off this viewport icon. That way I won't see it in edit mode or object mode. I can turn off the camera if I don't want the result to be rendered, and I can turn off the edit mode icon if I want to see this in object mode, but not in edit mode. A couple notes about the bevel modifier, since this is one that a lot of people want to start using right away, is that you can control which edges get beveled by using this limit method. By default, it's set to angle and at 30 degrees, so any edge with faces that meet at an angle greater than 30 degrees will get beveled and the rest won't. That's why if we look at this in wireframe view, we'll see that the part of the loops going around the flat faces aren't being beveled while everything else is. If you want to see exactly where this kicks in, then we can hit tab to go into edit mode. I'll turn this on for edit mode, select that top edge, and then hit G and Z and gradually move this down. At some point, a bevel there will pop into existence whenever we hit that 30 degree threshold. We can also set this limit method to none so that all edges get beveled no matter what, or we could set it to weight. Currently, all edges have a weight of zero, but if we select some edges, for example, just this front face here, I can go to Edge and Edge Bevel Weight, and then drag my mouse up or down to increase or decrease how much bevel gets applied to those edges. Then I'll hit Z and go to Solid View so I can see this better. And I don't want to get too far in the weeds on any particular modifier in this lesson, because I want to talk more about modifiers as a whole. One more thing that I do want to mention about this one, though, that always trips people up, is that there's one setting to check if your bevel isn't working. What happens a lot of the time is somebody will add an edge loop, or maybe even have an accidental edge loop, and it'll be too close to another edge. Notice how as my loop approaches, the bevel gets smaller and smaller. That's because there's an option in the bevel modifier under geometry called clamp overlap. This will keep the bevel from running into any other existing edges. If I turn this off, however, then overlaps will be allowed, and you might get some nasty results. However, at least the bevel will exist. Chances are you might have some overlapping edges or some issues there, or your mesh might be the wrong size for the size of the amount. Either way, if this modifier doesn't seem to be working, then that's the number one thing to check. For now though, I'll hit tab to go back to object mode and let's look at what happens when we add another modifier. I'll collapse this one and then go to add modifier, generate, and now let's look at the array modifier. 
This one allows you to duplicate your mesh as many times as you need to non-destructively. So right now I have two, but I can crank this up to way more than I will ever need before Blender starts slowing down, at least with a geometry that's simple like this. When the array is set to be a relative offset, it's spaced to match the size of the mesh, and a factor of one in any of these directions will make sure that those sides always line up perfectly. If I hit tab to go into edit mode and start scaling my object, then the array shrinks and grows with it. If I set this to a constant offset instead, then the size of the mesh has nothing to do with it. I can shrink this bigger or smaller, and they'll always be a fixed distance apart. Lastly, I can set what's called an object offset and use a second object as the reference. This one's a little bit more complex, but also really fun, so I want to show you here. First though, I need a second object to use as the reference point for this array. Since I don't need any actual geometry, I just need a point in space with a location and a rotation and a scale, I'll use an empty. I'll choose plane axes, and I'll leave it right at the center. So if I go into wireframe view, you can see that it's there, but just hidden in the middle. Now I'll select my mesh again, and choose that empty as the object. Now nothing has appeared to happen, but if I take my empty and start moving it, then we'll see all of those arrays start to come out. The second instance will be exactly where that object is located, and the others will be extrapolated from that. The cool thing about this is that we don't have to go in a straight line. We can go in a diagonal line or even start to rotate it, which is where things get really interesting. Now, I have an absurd amount of instances here, so let me turn this down to something more reasonable, like maybe 50. And then I'll continue rotating and scaling this until I have something that I like. You have to admit, this is pretty fun to mess with. Now let's look at adding another modifier, the mirror modifier, to make this symmetrical. I'll select the object again, go back to the modifiers list, go back to the generate section, and go down to mirror. Now I can make this symmetrical along the X, Y, and or Z axis. The most important thing to know about the mirror modifier is that it's all based on the object origin. So since the object origin is right in the middle of this first piece, then we're going to get a little bit of overlapping as this gets mirrored. So to move the first piece away from the object origin, I'll hit tab to go into edit mode, I'll hit seven to go to top view, and then I'll just move this over and off to the side. Just like that. And then I'll also bring this up along the Z axis since we're mirroring along that one as well. Then I'll hit tab to leave edit mode. Go ahead and take the empty and just move it around and have fun playing with this. If it's a little bit too slow, like it's starting to get here, then maybe go to the bevel modifier and decrease the number of segments. I'll set that to four just so that there's less geometry. And then I'll go to array and maybe turn the count down here to let's say 25. All right, now this should be a little bit more responsive. All right, I'll try not to get too carried away here, but it's a little bit difficult because this is kind of a cool effect. The thing that I initially made this to point out though is that the order of your modifier stack matters a lot. If we uncheck the monitor icons here to disable some of these modifiers, then we can step through what's happening. First, we're beveling the initial result, we're arraying that result to give us the tentacle-like shape, and then we're mirroring that over to the other axes. However, what do you think would happen if we switched the mirror and the array modifiers? Take a guess, and then let's give it a shot. I'll click and drag on the top right corner of the modifier, and drag and drop this above the array modifier, and now the result's completely changed. Well, if we step through this again, we'll see that we're still beveling the first result, so nothing's changed there, but then we're mirroring this result over on the other axes. Then we're taking that chunk and arraying it as a whole instead. So the order of operations here is crucial, and it's read from the top to the bottom. Now let's take a look at one more example. I'll hide the cube here, and I'll hide the empty as well, and then hit Shift A, Add Mesh, and a monkey. Then I'll hit period on my number pad to zoom right to it, and then on this monkey I'm going to add a new modifier, which is this subdivision surface. Again, that's in the generate section closer towards the bottom. Add that and you'll immediately see that the mesh is smoothed out and we can change the quality of this with the levels. Be careful though, this increases the poly count exponentially. So while you can increase this all the way up to six, I really wouldn't recommend it. Things are going to start to get really choppy. Instead, to get almost the exact same visual result at much better performance, set this to something like three at the max, sometimes even two works perfectly fine, and then just right click and shade smooth like we've done before. That's gonna work a whole lot better. This modifier is doing the exact same thing we were doing in edit mode when we did a subdivide, but then it's also smoothing the result. If we set this to simple, then it will be just that basic subdivision. I'll go into wireframe view here, 
and then turn off optimal display so that I can actually see all of the edges. And we'll see that as we increase the levels, then we're just cutting this in half and then in half again. Catmill Clark is just the smoothing algorithm, and that's what you're going to want most of the time. Now, working with the subdivision modifier is incredibly common, so there's actually a hotkey for changing the levels. If you hit Control-0, then that'll jump to subdiv level 0. You can hit Control-1, all the way up to Control-5 for a level 5. This even works if you don't have a subdivision modifier at all. If you just have your basic mesh, then you can hit Control-2, and immediately you'll get a subdivision surface modifier with a level 2. Now, if you're working with characters or creatures or anything like that, it's incredibly common to use the subdivision surface modifier along with the mirror modifier. So I want to show you how those two things interact because Blender does allow you to mirror some edits in edit mode, but not all of them. For example, we have the mirroring up here in the top right. We can just turn this on for the X axis. And if I grab an edge on the right side here, hit G and pull that up, then that is mirrored over to the other side. So that works great. However, what it doesn't do is mirroring, adding or removing geometry. So if I delete this edge or delete those vertices, then that's only been applied to one side. Or if I do an extrusion, or if I do, let's say, take a face and shift D and duplicate, none of that has been mirrored over. And so this option is unfortunately not that useful for most modeling. So I usually leave mirroring off in edit mode and instead use the mirror modifier. To do that, let's go back to add modifier. And if I don't want to actually look through this list, then I can just start typing mirror and that'll pop right up. Now, it doesn't look like anything's happened, but that's because our mesh was already symmetrical around the object origin. If I were to select everything with A in edit mode and then hit G and move this off to the side, you'll see that the whole thing has been duplicated. What we really want to do is only work on the right side and then have the left side filled in for us automatically. So we can actually just delete that whole half. What I'll do is go to X-ray view, vertex select mode, and then box select all these vertices on the left. Make sure not to select the center line because we definitely want to keep that and then hit delete and vertices. Then if we select everything with A, hit G to move, you can see that this is working perfectly. I'll turn off X-ray view now and any edits that we make, regardless of whether we delete something or add some geometry, this is always going to work exactly as we expect. The one thing to really remember about the mirror modifier though that I've said before is that it's all based around the object origin. So if your object origin is not along your center line or where you want your center line to be, then you're either going to get a gap or some overlap. So make sure that all lines up and you'll be good to go. Now, as you're working along the center line, you may find it a little bit inconvenient that if you move a vertex, you'll create this rip, or if you move this too far over to the other side, you'll get that overlap. So what you can do is over in the modifier, turn on clipping, and that'll make those vertices stick to the center line. I can move them along the other axes, but I can't pull it away along the X axis. What can occasionally happen though, is that you might have a vertex that you move and accidentally get stuck there, and then you can't move it back. Well, in that case, just turn off clipping temporarily, move that back, and then turn it back on. Lastly, if we go to object mode, then you'll notice that we have this sharp crease running right in the middle. Well, if you look at our modifier stack, it makes sense because what we're doing is we're smoothing and subdividing the result from edit mode, which has a sharp corner right here, and then we're mirroring that over. So to fix that, all we need to do is drag and drop the mirror modifier above the subdivision surface modifier, such that the mirror looks like this, and then we subdivide that as a whole. So again, the order of your modifier stack really matters. Lastly, if you want to apply a modifier, then you can just go to this drop down arrow and click apply. Then once you hit tab to go into edit mode, all of those changes will be there. Another way to do that is make sure the modifier is selected and has this blue outline around it, and then you can hit control A to apply it just like you'd apply transforms in the 3D viewport. Now you may be curious about several of these other modifiers, including the very exciting geometry nodes modifier. And while we definitely don't have time to get into all of that in this course, we do have other courses that go through this topic thoroughly. There's a course on CG Cookie from instructor Paul Kajeji that goes through all of the modifiers and what they do. I've also made a course called Assemble that's on there as well that goes into great detail on how to use geometry nodes. So check those out if you're curious and itching to get going. But if you're a beginner to 3D, I wouldn't recommend starting there. I'd recommend learning more about the fundamentals of the different areas of Blender before getting into that stuff. For now, I just want you to practice adding a couple different modifiers. Try out the bevel, the array, the mirror, and the subdivision surface modifiers. And don't forget to practice moving them to different orders to see what happens. Then in the next lesson, we'll take a bit of a step back from modeling and look at more features of Blender as a whole.